Hi there, everyone. I feel a bit of an anticlimax after the warm up act, but still, I'll see how I get on. Um, my name is Patrick Mulford. I'm the Executive Creative Director at The Audience. Um, for those of you who don't know about The Audience, we're one of the world's largest publishers of social content. We were started about four years ago uh, by Sean Parker of Napster, um, um, Facebook Infamy, and Ari Manuel from WME. There's about a hundred of us working from offices in um, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, and we publish about 6,000 pieces of content every single month and reach about a billion people online um, with about 12 to 15 billion impressions. Um, so did I say a million or a billion? A billion people online. Uh, and 12 to 15 billion impressions. Impressions is how many times it appears on people's pages. Um, so the content that we produce is generally um, conversations around brands and famous people, celebrities, influencers. Uh, and also entertainment properties such as films and television shows. And this rather rarefied position within the very fabric of the social graph has allowed us to glean some quite interesting pieces of information about people online. And it's this information that I'm going to share with you tonight. If you were to ask me what I do for a living, essentially what I do is a lot like a, a lot of you guys, um, I tell stories. And the platform I just happen to tell those stories on is social media. And a post, however small, is a story. A few years ago, Ernest Hemingway was challenged by a few of his friends. They bet him about $10 each that he couldn't write a story in six words. So Hemingway went away, probably had a few drinks, came back about half an hour later, and he says, I've got it. And his story was, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. And his friends gave him the money, and he probably got more drunk. And um, that story was 33 characters long. So compared to 33 characters, uh, a 140-character tweet is pretty indulgent. And as everybody knows, a picture paints a 1,000 words. And that's a proverb, which is another example of a very short story designed to impart a very important, um, profound pieces of information in a way that's memorable that you can pass on to other people. And that's how stories work. Stories have been the mechanic that we use to pass on uh, vital pieces of information, whether it's religious dogma or um, moral codes of conduct or more trivial things like gossip or advertising, uh, ever since we learned to open our mouths and point at things. And that's because stories allow you to um, captivate an audience. You grab their attention. Everyone's listening to you. They're, they're, they're listening to every word you say. So they're more likely to remember what you're saying. It also, stories are also designed to um, make very, very complex concepts easier to understand. Um, and then they're also designed to be memorable. So people remember what you told them, and then they pass it on to someone else. Of course, a story is only ever uh, as good as the way that you tell it. And so you're always trying to tell stories in a way that evokes the maximum emotional response from your audience. Now, it's no good having a story if you have no one to tell that story to. So generally speaking, the person who controlled the media channel was the person that controlled the message. And for, for 20,000 years, it, until about 2,000 years ago, uh, that it was oral tribe culture, word of mouth that passed on stories. And then that was largely replaced across Western Europe by the church during um, kind of a, about 1,000 years ago. This, uh, this church here is actually Christchurch Priory. It's dominated the skyline and also the culture of my hometown in the UK since about 1094. And at the time it was built, the main story was a collection of cautionary tales called the Bible, uh, and the Bible was written in Latin, and not many people were very literate, and even if they were literate, they couldn't read Latin, so the people that told the story was the clergy. And the cl clergy essentially controlled the culture. They even had um, a stranglehold on gossip. They used to listen into the gossip. If you look at, on the far right-hand side of that shop, there's this huge entrance called the North, North Porch. The North Porch, th that porch never needed to be that big. But what they did is they ran a wooden bench around the inside of that, uh, that building, and that was the largest enclosed structure in the town. So if it was raining, which it invariably is in the south of England, that was where everybody would go and chat and hang out. And there was little holes in the top walls of that building where the clergy could listen in and find out what everybody was talking about. 
Um, and to this day, there's a replica of the ducking stool next to the river. And anybody that um, gossiped, um, they were known as scolds, and they were strapped to that chair, and they were dunked in a stream to, to teach them a lesson. Now, the church's stranglehold on the message ended very, very rapidly around the mid-15th century when Johannes Guggenheim, Guggenheim, Gug, the Guggenheims are everywhere in this town, Gutenberg, um, <laughs> invented the printing press. And ironically, the first manuscript that he printed was a Bible. But very, very quickly, his invention was making it far easier for doctors, scientists, scholars, writers, artists to share stories with everybody around the world. It's believed that within the first 50 years of the, the Gutenberg press being invented, there was about 150 to 200 million books in circulation around the world. And the, the era of mass communication had well and truly begun. And it was a, 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 an era that changed society fundamentally um, uh, forever. And during the last, the last 500 years has seen mass communication change in lots and lots of different ways. It's morphed into television, newspaper, publishing, film. There's lots and lots of forms of mass communication around the world now. But essentially, in essence, mass communication has always been the same. And that's a single source, a single storyteller, telling as many people as possible, far and wide, far and wide about this one piece of information they want to tell them about. And a lot of that information has to do with product services, entertainment properties, something that they're trying to sell, advertising. And then something very strange happened. The internet gave birth to social media. Social media is very, very different from any other form of mass communication. Essentially, it's just a collection of people. Um, it's a colony of living things all talking to each other and interacting with each other. There is no single source talking to everybody. It's everybody talking to one another. This is actually a computer-generated model of a social network. And it looks like a colony of, of living things. Uh, the bright spots are um, the, the brightest nodes in the network. They're the influencers, the brands with the most connections. And as this network grows, the strength of their connection grows with them, and it's chaotic, and it's unpredictable. And that's what makes it so fascinating as a media channel. You can't um, predict results you can the way with traditional media. You're at the mercy of all those individual nodes at the network and their, their individual emotional needs. You can't replicate the same um, results twice, um, and you never quite know what's going to happen when you tell a story in social. Because the whole thing is all about emotions. This is uh, Plutchik's emotional circumplex, which is a very complicated diagram that explains um, how uh, emotions are um, structured. And it's not as, as simple as emotions like happy, sad, angry. It's a, a very subtle cocktail of emotional triggers that have evolved over millions of years in order to increase our chances of survival. Robert Plutchik was a psychologist who believed that there was eight bipolar emotions at the center of this diagram, and it's like a color wheel. You can mix and match different emotions, and they, they get milder as you come out towards the outsides, but new emotions emerge when some of them are, are mixed with one another. And a lot of these emotions are rolling around in your head at any given moment. Uh, and you're not in control of them. You're at the mercy of them. They all come from a, a very primitive part of your brain called the amygdala. It's also known as the um, reptilian brain. And it's the, the part of the brain that makes you bite your lip when you see a sad movie. There's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's instinctive. This is the amygdala. It's about the size of a peanut. And it's very important, not just because it controls your emotions, but it's very, very important when it comes to making choices. So there's been lots and lots of studies by scientists uh, of people who've had uh, amygdala damage or lost the use of their amygdala completely. And they found that it's very difficult for them to make any choices, any decisions. There was one man that had uh, bipolar uh, amygdala damage, and they put him in a room and they asked him to choose between a red and a blue pencil. And they went away, and half an hour later they came back in the room and he was staring at the pencils because he couldn't place an emotional value on either of those things. So if you're someone that's trying to manipulate someone, leverage a message, tell, person, tell a person a story, you've got to know how these emotions work because otherwise these people aren't going to make the choices you want them to make. 
Uh, and as I say, these are very, very primal emotions that we're talking about here, and that's because the amygdala takes a very, like the rest of the human body, takes a very long time to evolve. Now, 20,000 years ago, all human beings were lactose intolerant. So there was an enzyme in our body that allowed us to process milk when we were weaning, and then after we'd weaned, we didn't need it anymore, so it went away. But then uh, human beings started to domesticate goats and cows, and at that point, some people developed an enzyme that, that stayed with them for a lot longer in their life, at least until old age. And over time, genes muta mutated, and more and more people became lactose persistent. And today, 90% of Americans and almost as many Europeans are lactose persistent. And that's a great, allegedly, a great example of evolution, human evolution. Um, but unfortunately, technology tends to be updated faster than every 20,000 years. So essentially, the person working this iPad at the moment is still a caveman. I can ad adapt to my environment intellectually, but I'm still at the mercy of those emotions that essentially evolved when I was... Um, a caveman in order to ensure that there was more chance of me surviving. For instance, if I saw a rattlesnake, there was more chance of me surviving uh, if I felt scared because I'd run away. If I felt love towards uh, my children and my partner, there was more chance of me protecting them. And if I felt angry towards an adversary, there was more chance of me um, uh, attacking him or being um, aggressive in some way. Now, when the internet was first invented, it was invented to be useful. It was a utilitarian device. It was there to uh, provide a form of communication so people could talk to one another cost-effectively. And uh, it was also invented so that people could um, see information. It was a mass, com mass communication channel and people were putting information on the internet and you were reading, it was lots of advertising. It was, it was very, very um, utilitarian in nature. Now, Social media is very different. It's completely emotional in nature. And we're seeing all sorts of very, very interesting um, content evolve out of the internet and out of this initial use that's, that's uh, emotional in, in, in um, um, it, it's emotional content. People today only use social media for four things, just four things. All of the content in social media all revolves around four things. First one is communication. It's kind of a, a legacy of the internet. The second thing is that we create a social identity for ourselves through affiliation. The third thing is that we share life moments. And the fourth thing is that we express mutual values and passions. And I'll explain how all of that works in a little bit more detail. So communication speaks for itself. People still talk to one another on the internet. Uh, the second thing is that we're, we're affiliating ourselves with the things that have meaning in our lives. So everybody likes to think that they're different from everyone else. And the way that we define our uniqueness is through our personality, the things and the people that we love, the things that we're interested in, the people we follow, and the stuff that we've done, our experiences and our memories. Social media gives us a platform to do this. Now, this isn't uh, a new thing at all. We've been doing it again for thousands and thousands of years. We use artistic, artistic expression as a way of expressing our place in the world. So tribal art uh, generally revolved around three things. When we drew pictures on the side of a cave wall, they were generally pictures of our environment, our village, our society, the people we hung out with, the, the way that our village was structured, what we hunted, who chased us, who we chased. The second thing was creation mythology, where the sun comes from, where does it go, what pushes up the daisies. And the third thing was an obsession with the female form and fertility. So nothing much changes in 20,000 years. Um, the other thing that we do is we use physical expression to express our place within that society. So this is, a, this is an Iban tribes person from Sarawak in southwest Borneo. I photographed him a few years ago. And every single, if you, if you talk to anthropologists, they'll tell you that every tattoo on his body signifies an experience, something in his life, something he's gone through, where he is in his tribe. It explains his social status, it explains whether he's married or not, how many kids he has, his seniority, what village he comes from, what tribe he comes from, where, where, how, many, how many skulls are hanging from his, his place in the longhouse, um, and how many people he's killed. The interesting thing was when 
I asked the translator to ask him what his tattoos meant. He said, yeah, well, most of my tattoos kind of mean something, but a lot of them I got because my friends were getting them and I thought they were cool. So <laughs> peer pressure was important even back then, just like it is today. That's a true story. I'm not making that up. That's what he said. Um, and, and it's important to form your identity uh, and, and, and find your place in the world, especially when you're young, because when you're young, you're doing it for the first time, separate from your parents. So everybody remembers when they were a kid, and they used to put posters and pictures on their bedroom wall. And these tended to be pictures of uh, films they loved or bands they loved, and um, pictures of a Ferrari that they wanted to buy when they were older, or pictures that, of their friends that had meaning for them or members of their family. Well, people aren't doing it on their bedroom wall anymore. They're doing it on social networks. So social media has become the new bedroom wall. So it's the place you affiliate yourself with uh, influencers, celebrities, people that are followed vicariously by millions and millions of people. Uh, brands, if a brand stands for something more than just a product, there's a good chance you may follow a brand. Uh, your family, obviously, your friends, obviously. Uh, art and entertainment properties like films and music acts uh, and TV shows. Uh, aff affinity groups such as schools and sports clubs and churches. And then also places as well, so places you've been, places that mean something to you. And people create a profile for themselves in different ways on different platforms. So Facebook has become kind of the de facto place where you create your generic profile for yourself. But then when you look at LinkedIn, if you're in LinkedIn, that's the place that you kind of project your professional self. And then uh, Instagram is more of an idealized life. You kind of project an, uh, your idealized life to your, your friends. And then Pinterest is kind of your aspirational aesthetic. You're trying to explain and express to people visually how you see the world. And then there's niche platforms such as SoundCloud. If you're into new music, you'll go there to express what kind of music you're into and the fact that you're into new music in the first place. And the way that people are assigning value to different nodes in the network, different entities, is from a position of complete neutrality. And they're not necessarily expecting anything back from the things that they like and the th people that they follow. For instance, Microsoft is one of the biggest brands in the world. And it's also a brand that arguably struggles to create an emotional connection with its, with its uh, consumer. It has 6.7 million followers on Facebook alone. But it posts about twice a day. And on average, it gets 508 likes per post. Like, they're really, really lucky if they get over 1,000 likes. Now, if you compare that to Apple, Apple have never, ever, ever posted anything in social media, ever. They don't even have a page. There's 43 million followers on a generic Wikipedia page that Facebook have put up for Apple. And these people are never going to get any reward from Apple, but this is the world's most loved and most valuable brand. And people feel that there is an intrinsic value in Apple that's worth following, even if they're not going to get anything in, in return. And then you get influencers and celebrities. And just as, a, as, a, as an example, I've put up Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan has 63.7 million followers. And his posts can get, so this is, the, this is his most popular post in the last six months. It's him with two Labrador puppies. And it's got 3 million likes. Um, and he knows what he's doing. Like Jackie Chan really knows what he's doing. And he loves social media. And he really, really likes to interact with his fans. And you put him in front of a camera, and he will do whatever you ask him to do in order to please those fans. He knows how important those fans are to him. He also knows how important puppies are on the internet. <laughs> because after babies, puppies and kittens are the most popular content in social. The only thing for Jackie Chan that is more popular than puppies is panda bears. If he takes a picture of himself with panda bears, he'll get even more likes than 3 million. And the highest we've ever seen from Jackie Chan is when he had his picture taken with a baby panda. <laughs> and and that, that just broke the internet. And, and this is because people aren't interested in brands. They're not interested in, in, in the products those brands make. They're interested in the values those brands stand for. And it's exactly the same with celebrities. People aren't interested in, interested in the, play, the people they play in a film. They're, peop, they're, they're interested in the values that that celebrity stands for. So 
the most liked celebrities sell feelings rather than a character. This is the top eight most popular actors and actresses in social at this moment in time. And these eight posts are their most popular posts during the last six, month, uh, six months. And you'll notice that there is no red carpet shots. There is no pictures of them professionally taken in a studio. And there's no pictures of them as the characters they portray in films. They all stand for much more than that. They stand for a state of mind, a memory, a feeling, an emotion. They have very definite tones of voice and very definite opinions. So if you take Vin, and they're also not necessarily the most popular actors in the world. Uh, they're, not, they're not generally megastars. I mean, some of them are megastars, but they're not the biggest mega, mega, megastars. So Vin Diesel is the most popular actor in the world in social at this moment in time. And uh, he's got, I think I've written it down somewhere, he's got something like 90, he's got 94 million fans across the internet. And this is, his mo this is the most popular post from any of these guys, I think, in the last six months. It's a picture of him on the phone with his dog. <laughs> so um, closely followed by Will Smith, who uh, is in he's on holiday at the Leaning Tower of Pisa taking a selfie. Uh, I really like Dwayne Johnson's. He, he was flagged down by this young kid um, at Easter, and this young kid had suffered from cancer and told him that watching his films had got him through the illness. And that, that blew up. That's 3.6 million likes. Jackie Chan with his puppies. I love the picture of um, uh, Emma, Watson. Emma Watson at the end, purely because, I mean, it's massive. It's almost 4 million likes. And it's, for me, it, it sums up how people feel about Emma is the fact that they grew up with her. They've seen her go all the way through school, and she's just graduated. And people have liked it because they feel as if they've, they've gone on that journey with her. Um, then you've got Jason Statham. He tends to do really, really well when he shows his life um, and how it, it revolves around Ferraris and fast cars and fast motorbikes. But not the characters in his film. He's just known for being that cool guy with lots of expensive cars. Um, Megan Fox is still very, very popular even when she takes a selfie in a car. Uh, and and the, the fact that these are the brightest nodes in the network means that uh, they have a, a, a huge amount. I mean, the word influencer isn't just a... Uh, um, the, they really, really are influencers. They, they have a lot of sway over what the people on the internet do. Uh, people tend to follow the brightest light. There was, a, an, there was an experiment done in 2008, I think, in Leeds University, where a load of scientists put 200 people in a room, and they told them to just walk around randomly. But unbeknown to 190 of them, 10 had been told to walk in a clockwise direction. And after five minutes, everybody was walking in a clockwise direction. The interesting thing was that afterwards, when they interviewed the 190, they said, why did you walk in a clockwise direction? And a lot of them said, well, I just thought it was a really good, sensible thing to do. So I started walking in a clockwise direction, and everybody followed me. Um, but it's not true. These influencers are the ones that are kind of leading the pack. And at the audience, a lot of what we do is about telling stories vicariously through these influences in order to convince people to do things. And, um, We've, we've broken box office records um, for films doing that. We've got uh, albums to number one. Uh, we took an unknown, unsigned band and um, got 320 million people to watch their music video and then got them signed to Universal. Uh, we sold out Wrigley Fields in a matter of minutes. Uh, and we do a lot of work with brands as well, telling stories to get people interested in brands. So the power of influence can never, ever be underestimated. The third thing that we do in social networks is we record life moments. It's become the de facto uh, platform for us to um, re record the rolling narrative of our lives. But we never just put everything up there. Like No one takes every single granular piece of their life and posts it on Facebook. We're always trying to project the, a specific kind of life to people. We're curating every single one of our life moments for a reason. You see. Social networks are great because in real life, you don't get a second chance. If you, if you fluff, then everyone sees it, and you can't go back and, and rewrite it. In social, you can edit. You can look at that picture. You can take it again. You can, you can put a filter over the top of it. You can carefully create your persona. So you're projecting the persona you want people to see to the world. And a lot of people uh, have a very distinct flavor to their pages. A lot of people brag. 
they make their lives look infinitely more interesting and superior to yours. Um, they kind of do this in order to make up for all those dubious life choices they've made since they were an awkward kid at school and, and make themselves look like they're actually doing well for themselves. I'm not talking about myself at all. There's some people. Um, other people do the opposite. Like everyone's got friends that tend to seek sympathy. I've got a friend that tends to write things like, I hate freeways and cars. Or he'll say something like, I can't believe that just happened. And you look at it and you think, what am I supposed to do with that? I'm, I'm not supposed to like that, am I? And I'm certainly not going to share it. No, you're supposed to comment. You're supposed to empathize. You're supposed to say, oh, what happened? And he's looking for someone that feels what he's feeling or at least empathizes with what he's feeling. No one needs to know that his life sucks to, to, to a granular level, but it's a lot cheaper than therapy. So um, I, I imagine he's going to continue to do that um, forever, probably. Uh, other people make very public affirmations. So I found this, uh, apologies if you're in the audience, but there was, it's a very, very, very nice Range Rover, brand new Range Rover, and it had, uh, this, this is the license plate. And I couldn't work out whether this was a public affirmation thanking the person that had bought the car, or whether it was a public affirmation about how much they loved their puppy, because there was like footprints all the way around the, um, the plate. But you'll notice that people do that a lot on, uh, in, in social networks. People will go out with, for a meal with their friends one evening, and then the next day they'll tell everybody how much they love their friends. You think, well, couldn't you just private message them um, and tell them individually, or even tell them in person? And other people will um, profess to loving their child more than anything in the world, even though the child isn't even on the internet and can't read. But this is, this is public affirmations and... and, and um, they're attesting to the strength of the relationships. And when people like, like those posts, it reinforces that this is a strong relationship and people agree with them. There's no better example of people curating their self-image in social than a selfie. Um, people take, on average, 10 selfies, or certainly young, younger people that take hundreds of selfies, they only post one in every 10. So for every, every one they post, there's nine they discarded because it doesn't perfectly um, express normally what, what's, what's normally a particular characteristic of their personality. And that, that characteristic may, might be that they're funny. It might be that they're desirable. It might be that they're adventurous. There's lots and lots of different kinds of selfies and different images that you see um, expressing these characteristics, but they generally tend to be just one. Um, there's a, a case of a, a young kid, I think he's 19, there's, a, there's someone called Danny Bowman in the UK, and he used to take 200 selfies a day. He used to take 10 as he got up, and he spent 10 hours a day taking selfies and preparing himself and wearing different clothes. He dropped out of school, he lost 30 pounds, he, he just didn't leave the house in the end, and he ended up trying to take his life, and his mum found him and saved him. And uh, he's now a popular guest in talk shows, so in a funny way, he kind of managed to find the acceptance he was looking for all along. Uh, and, and Danny Bowman, he's not alone. Most people are, are, are terribly insecure. We're all looking for love and acceptance. Um, you know, our bodies respond to rejection in the same way that it responds to physical pain. There's, there's been um, studies that have done that have shown that the last 15 high school shootings in America only two of those kids weren't rejected by all their friends. And what we tend to do isn't want people to accept us. We want people to access, accept who we think we are. And the disconnect is that we worry that they see us in a very, very different light to the way that we see ourselves. And so social allows us to curate the image that we're wanting them to accept. Fourth way, fourth and final way that we use social media is that we share mutual values and passions with one another. Uh, and, and we do that by posting content, all sorts of different kinds of content. And we, it's never a selfless act. Whenever we post a piece of content, we're looking for a, for a response from our friends. We're looking for likes and shares and comments. That is a way of affirming our place within our society. So this jacket here is actually, this is called the Like a Hug Jacket. It was created by MIT Media Lab in about 2011. It's a physical jacket filled with air bellows that inflate, and it's connected to your phone by, via Bluetooth. And whenever anybody likes any of your content, it inflates to give you a physical hug. And, 
And, and hugs are very, very important to the human psyche. Pioneering psychotherapist Virginia Satir said that everybody needs eight hugs a day in order to remain emotionally stable. And children need twice as many, they need 16. So that's why, to emotionally grow. So that's why children tend to elicit more cuddles than adults do. And whenever anybody likes, comments, or shares a piece of content that you've posted on the internet, what they're doing is they're giving you a virtual hug. They're reinforcing, your, a, sen they're reinforcing a sense of belonging within that social network. So everybody's always looking for content that allows them to connect with their friends. And the way you do this is you find a piece of content that has, has, a, has a value attached to it that you know you share with that person. So if I was interested in making model trains and I knew that none of my friends thought that was a cool thing to do with my spare time, I would not be posting content about model trains because it would be rejected and my friends wouldn't like it. So I am always looking for content that I know they're going to like. The greatest... The, the, the best thing I can do is find content that, that resonates with the greatest amount of people. And I'm looking for that in all sorts of different places. I'm looking across the internet. I'm looking in different brand channels. I'm looking at some of the people I know. But a lot of the time, the content I'm going to repost is stuff that's been sent to me. Some of it comes from my friends. Some of it comes from brands. Some of it comes from influencers. This is uh, a screenshot of the Dove Beauty Sketches video that was produced about a year, year and a half ago. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen it, it was uh, a video that showed a forensic artist who was behind a screen and a woman would describe herself to him and he'd draw a picture. And then a, another woman would come in who'd met the person who described herself and then she'd describe that person to the forensic artist. And the, the drawing... Or that, was, that was described by the person who just randomly met the woman was always more beautiful than the woman's description of herself. And this is the most viewed piece of branded content um, so far. It's 200 million views. And uh, we helped Dove uh, distribute this across the internet. There was a 1,000 pieces of ancillary content just to get this in front of people. So most people think they've seen the video. What they actually saw as the first touch point wasn't the video. It was a piece of content in... Six, targeted to 16 different territories in five different languages, lots and lots of different creative treatments. That, so there's, there's a lot going on in order to make people view this 200 million times. But at the same time, this was a piece of uh, branded content that didn't feature a product at all. It was two and a half minutes long, and they didn't mention any products. What they did is they perfectly... Um, elicited an emotion, a value that resonated with almost every woman in the world and most men as well. So they managed to encapsulate something that everybody feels. And it became a tremendously effective mechanic for people to connect with each other. And that's why it was shareable. Now, the big problem with sharing things on, in social is the fact that it's always an act of bravery because you, know, you never know how your friends are going to react to this piece of content. Um, so everybody's done that thing where you find something really edgy and cool, you think all well, your friends are going to like it, and you post it, and you sit there, and an hour later no one said anything, <laughs> and you think, shit. And then two hours go by and no one said anything. Three hour mark, you normally pull it. You realize you've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> so it's a bit like telling a joke. And um, all right, I'm going to try this. This could, this could go terribly wrong, but I'll try it anyway. So did, does everybody know that apparently no one likes the Flintstones in Dubai? but apparently the people in Abu Dhabi do. <laughs> See, there you go. So, so someone told me that joke, and I thought that you guys would like it. And the fact that you laughed means that you did. And you maybe liked it so much that you'll share it with other people. And the fact that you laugh reflects favorably on me. You now think I'm a marginally funnier guy than I was before. Of course, if you hadn't laughed, I would have looked like a complete ass. And my, my standing within this social network would have gone down. And, and that's essentially how it works. And this is why memes are really important, because memes limit the risk of rejection, because you're riding on the back of a creative platform that you know have, has already been accepted by all of your friends. So by placing your sentiment on top of that existing meme, there's less chance of people thinking that you're an ass. Uh, so far, in the last five years, something like seven million different keep calm and carry on posters have been created, different not shares, seven million different iterations. So that sentiment has been 
uh, repurposed to mean virtually any emotion, any sentiment that could possibly ever exist anywhere, which is not bad for a poster that I think they created about two million, two million keep calm and carry on posters at the start of World War II, thinking the Germans were immediately going to bomb the south coast of the, the south of England, and when it didn't happen, that that. Um, story doesn't, didn't resonate with anybody, so it was useless. So they, they destroyed them all. And then in 1980, I think, uh, one was found between two second-hand books in a second-hand bookstore store in the north of England. And it was a really cool poster. And it kind of meant something. It was kind of quirky. So the owner of the bookstore placed it up on a wall, and then people commented on it, and he started selling mugs and T-shirts and tea towels. But it wasn't until 2008, when the recession hit, that suddenly, keep calm and carry on meant everything to everyone, and suddenly it exploded. So your story can sit there for a very, very long time, and no one will see it, and no one will care, and then suddenly it means everything for everyone. Now, few people would argue that social networks are growing in strength and ubiquity. And as they grow, they're empowering people, not just to share content, but also to share the values that are important to them in their lives. And everybody remembers what happened when we all became empowered consumers because of the internet. So the internet allowed us to compare and contrast different services and products and work out which one represented the best value for money for us. And then we could rate and review them afterwards and, and make it far easier for other people to make the right choices after us. And that power, when it was paired with this emerging technology, transformed virtually every single industry. So look at what it did to music. Look at what it did to publishing and to newspapers and magazines. The way that we buy cars or the way that we buy uh, consumer electronics, the way that we choose what restaurant we want to go to, or even the way that we hail a cab. Everything changed. Social media, I believe, is going to do exactly the same thing, but it's going to turn us into empowered uh, individuals, em empowered global citizens. It's going to allow us to compare and contrast different values that are important in our lives and work out which ones are the most important. And these are values that will transcend um, politics and geographical boundaries and, and religion or advertising. We're free to make these choices, relatively free to make these choices, um, without any kind of influence from people. So. Um, the, the most interesting thing about social is the fact that the value that we, we share more than any other with more people around the world than any other thing is goodness, positive sentiment. When you look at the content that's out there, there is more positive sentiment than anything else. So social media has the power to elevate humanity because of this. And when you look at the impact that's having in politics, it's already having a profound effect. The Arab Spring probably wouldn't have been as big as it was if it wasn't for social media. Occupy Wall Street was allegedly started by a tweet, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Politics is the tip of the iceberg. And what this means is that, for the first time, social stories have the power to change the world. So for a humble storyteller working in social, that's, that's an amazing prospect. So meanwhile, in Hollywood, what does, this, what does this mean to the studios, to the film industry? What does it mean for you guys? Uh, and there's lots and lots of very, very interesting things happening. So the first thing that's happening is that actors are becoming influencers. And some of these actors have such large fan bases that they have a reach that's far greater than the traditional advertising campaign for that film could possibly be. So um, a lot of the studios are leveraging um, the power of influences in order to, in order to promote a film. So this is a, this is a shot from Spring Breakers that came out two years ago. And it was an independent movie, production um, budget was about $5 million. This is the, the top four cast members of that film. And this is their combined um, social reach. So this is how many people like and follow them across the internet. Now if Selena Gomez is taken purely as an actress, She's actually got a larger reach than Vin Diesel. So if you take those four people and you turn them into a media property and you get them to promote the, sh the, the film rather than do a traditional advertising campaign, campaign that's going to be pretty powerful. So that's exactly what we did with A24 Films. Instead of spending 10% of the budget on social, 90% on a traditional campaign, 
we reduce the budget dr dramatically and then spend about 10% on traditional advertising like billboards and TV ads and spend the other 90% but targeting these people's fans in social. Now, Spring Breakers wasn't the biggest film of the year, but it had the, I think it was the, the third highest per screen average of any film that year, and it made something like $30 million, so sixfold what the production budget was. So it just shows, and it's the perfect storm. I mean, these people are hugely, hugely popular with the target audience. Um, they're massive, massive influences in their own rights. So it was, it was the obvious thing to do, but it shows how powerful a media property these actors can be if you use their influences and target them. Conversely, there's a lot of influencers out there that are now becoming actors. So this guy here, he's really, really nice. He's a really nice guy. His name is King Batch. His real name is, I think it's Andrew Batchelor. And he's a Canadian-born American actor who made his, made his name in Vine. He's got 11.7 .7 million followers on Vine. Something like 3.6 billion loops of his videos have been seen by his fans. And, uh, and he's a professional. He's a professional social media actor. There's nothing far, silly and, um, and pointless about what he does. He's very, very careful and calculated about how he goes around making his silly and pointless videos. Um, his alter ego online is a very, very energetic, crazy guy um, that does all sorts of comedy sketches. And he tends to cross-populate um, a cast that includes Kim Kardashian and Justin Bieber. He knows that these people have got massive followings. If he's going to do something, he might as well do it with someone that's got even more followers than him because it means that those people are then going to mention him in their, their tweets and in their videos as well. So he's built, he's built his following very, very carefully. And it's, it's really, really uh, reaping dividends now. He's a regular on House of Lies. He's a regular on The Mindy Project. He's in a show called Black Jesus. He's got his own show on Hulu. And he's in four different motion pictures that are currently in production. Casting directors are realizing that, certainly for the minor cast members, for bit parts, having influences in there is really, really important because they can give these guys two lines and they'll get it in front of, you know, he'll, he'll get it in front of 11.7 .7 million people. And the influencers don't necessarily be, have to be actors. We work with stylists, we work with choreographers, the people that provide the soundtrack. If you look at Fifty Shades of Grey, the, the release of the trailer was put back a year, so that, a year, uh, put back a day, so that Beyonce could release the single from the, the, the film the day before and build a head of, a head of steam. So, and we also have a lot of influencers that work with us that will spend their time talking about a film. So they don't even have to be in it, they can just be saying how much they're looking forward to seeing it. And fans are becoming influencers too, because, inf be because the, the, the most liked properties in, in the social system aren't always uh, uh, brands or even films. They can be characters from films. So Deadpool is one of the most popular characters in Marvel Comics roster. He's foul-mouthed, irrever irreverent, uh, and, and totally, totally inappropriate. So he doesn't necessarily fit into the model that um, 20th Century Fox normally use when they're making a superhero movie, so they've shied away from him for a long time. They did a test a few years ago with Ryan Reynolds uh, and Blur Studios did it in Venice, and they realized that this was just so offensive that they just couldn't make a film out of it. But then that, move, that, that piece of footage leaked online, it was shown at Comic-Con and then it was leaked, and everyone went crazy about it. The, the, the internet just lit up with comments about that video. And in the end, based upon the amount of people talking about that video, 20th Century Fox said, right, actually, we should make this film. However, there is a precedent that says that whenever we make an R-rated superhero movie, it, it dives. It doesn't do well at all. So it has to be PG-13. Again, all those fans said, we are not going to see Deadpool in a PG-13 movie. It's got to be R-rated. And in the end, 20th Century Fox said, yeah, OK, it's going to be R-rated. In fact, um, their April Fool's joke was to have an interview with Ryan Reynolds where he said how, don't worry, the, fa the film's going to be PG-13, but it's not going to have a, a massive impact on it. It's going to retain its integrity. And the person that was interviewed him was then torn apart by Deadpool, who wandered in and said, happy, happy, uh, you know, happy April Fool's. So they're actually toying with the fans now and playing with them and manipulating them and having fun. Now, those fans are very, very active on Twitter. So... Uh, 
and Ryan Reynolds is very antisocial. He doesn't like social networks at all. But in the end, he's had to give in to the amount of pressure to go on Twitter. So in November, he went on Twitter, and he's now an active tweeter. And he's got over a quarter of a million fans already. Of course, in order to become an influencer, you first have to build a social profile for yourself. And it's tough, like everyone's trying to do it. So how do you go about it? And there's no easy ways. You can, you can buy fans. Lots of people bought fans in the, in, in the past. And then there was purges from people like Instagram who went, right, we're going to go through and see how many inactive users there are, and we're going to purge them. And suddenly, all these people that had 5 million followers went down to like a million. And everyone realized that lots and lots of people have been buying fans. Even if it doesn't come to that, if you're very, very savvy, you can see where people are buying um, fans and not actually engaging them. If, someone gets, if someone's got three or four million fans and no one's commenting or liking on any of those posts, you can be pretty sure that none of those people are real or those people are bought and they're not actually interested in that person. And Facebook and the other networks will penalize you if you do that because their algorithms are based upon the amount of engagement that your, your um, posts get. So someone like King Batch has something like three or four times less fans than Kevin Hart. However, he gets so much engagement that his, his posts appear much more on feeds than Kevin Hart's. So he's a much more effective person uh, and a much more effective storyteller and social than someone like Kevin Hart is, based upon the amount of engagement he gets. So the first thing you need to do is know where your fans hang out. Know who your target audience is, know who they are, know what platforms they use. If you're talking to 18-year-olds, if you're talking to kids younger than that, chances are they're not even on Facebook. They're on in Instagram, they're on Snapchat, they're on the newer platforms. Um, if you're talking to an older audience, then, uh, then Facebook is a lot more uh, impactful and will reach a lot more people. If you know that your fans are interested in you because you're living this amazing Hollywood life and it looks awesome and there's an aesthetic to it that's amazing, then maybe you should be on Instagram. Uh, always work out what platforms are going to be the most effective before you start posting content because if your fans are somewhere else and you're posting here, don't be surprised if no one's interested with what you're saying. They are interested, they're just, they're just, you have to go where the waves are. Uh, the next thing is that you'll notice all of those actors had a very, very specific tone of voice. So they are, no, they are known for a perspective on the world. Dwayne Johnson is, he stands for re really, really virtuous American values. All of his posts are all about uh, how amazing this country is and, and how, it, how, how important it is to give back to communities, that kind of thing. Um, Jason Statham knows that people don't want to see him gardening. They want to see him next to a muscle car or a, a motorcycle. So you have to have a distinct tone of voice. People need to know what they're going to see whenever they go to your feed. And don't try and be disingenuous. You have to be um, authentic because people sniff you out immediately. They know who they're talking to and they know when it's disingenuous. Uh, as I say, it's not about the number of fans. It's, that it's about how much you engage them. So if you're posting lots and lots of content to lots of people who aren't noticing, no one's going to see it because over time, Facebook will penalize you. We've done campaigns where... Um, just, as a, just as a test, we've taken a music video that we've produced and thought, right, well, what will happen if we show this music video to the wrong people? And we've paid influencers to promote it to the wrong audience. And what happens is that less people end up seeing the music video than if you'd actually got these people to promote it because they're, they're, they're telling people that aren't interested, those people aren't watching the video, and therefore Facebook's algorithm says, that's not an exciting piece of content, I'm not going to show it to anyone. So less people that would have been interested get to see it as well. So whatever you do, you must make sure that all of your content is engaging. And you have to stay topical and relevant. You have to be talking about what's going on. Things are moving and changing fast so quickly. The tre things that trended yesterday are forgotten tomorrow. So see what's happening in the news, what's topical, ride on the back of existing memes. Make sure that you're, you're in touch with what's happening. Don't create 20 posts and then program them for the next two months because in two months' time, it will be completely irrelevant what you're talking about now. Uh, leverage your relationship. So one of the things that people that live in Los Angeles have in their favor is they tend to know influencers. They tend to know people that already have a big following. We have a lot of influencers that will date somebody and the person they're dating who had no fans will suddenly become an influencer in their, in their own right because they're hanging out with someone that is famous and now everybody wants to get to know them too. So 
cross population is very important. We've taken people like Pitbull, who had 80, he had 800,000 fans about three years ago, and within a year he had 8 million, and it was because Pitbull understood that the best thing he could do, seeing that he'd saturated his original genre, was to cross-populate everything he did. So whenever he recorded a song, it would be with a country artist or a pop artist or a rock art artist. He would always be putting himself in front of a completely different audience every single time. So when you're talking and hanging out with people that you know with larger uh, fan bases than you, when they mention you in their posts, suddenly you're exposed to a completely new audience and more people are going to be following you. Um, and then Los Angeles is the place where more influencers live than anywhere else in the world. A lot of the young influencers that we work with are young kids who are essentially the popular people in school. And a couple of years ago, there'd be 150 people that would follow them because no, no one else could. That was, that was the town they were in. That was as many people as they could connect to. Now the popular kid can connect to 5, 10, 20 million people around the world. And when they do that, they're always hungry for content. They're always looking for... for what you want to do is you want to look at the popular kid and you, you want to live your life vicariously through them. So invariably, they all move to... Most of them move to LA. Few move to New York and Miami the majority move here with their parents as their managers. And they do that because more is going on in this town and it's sexier and it's more fascinating to the rest of the world than virtually any other place in the world. So there is a great opportunity to allow people to live their lives vicariously through you by posting content about the place that you live in. And if you look at a lot of content that comes from major influencers, it's, it's in this place. They're on the beach, they're in their cars, they're driving down sunset, they're talking about this place because we may not realise how amazing this city is to live in, but the rest of the world thinks it's the best place to live in in the entire world. And last and, and by no means least, you have to buy a puppy. You have to buy either a puppy or a baby panda or possibly a kitten um, because they're incredibly useful if you're trying to drive engagement to your, uh, to, your, to your feed. And that's it. Thank you very much. OK, I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to read. I'm going to read all the questions. I'm not going to go, right, next one. Um, so this is a question from Angela who says, what do you say about a person who has no desire at all to engage in social media? <laughs> and is, is there any advice for them other than just do it, it's beneficial? Um, as, as I say, it's a tool and it's a very useful tool, but you, you don't have to do it. Um, there are a lot of very, very famous people who aren't on social at all and have been... Um, very, very successful in their career without the use of social media. So you, but by no means do you have to engage. Um, other people don't actually engage themselves. They get, they get professionals possibly to manage their pages for them and post all the stuff um, um, on their behalf. So you don't actually have to be the person that's posting every single day. But it certainly isn't the only way to become successful. It hasn't completely taken over just yet. Um... I'm going to struggle. Okay, uh, I think I know what this says. So Elizabeth says, how do you get influencers to promote your product? Paid, barter, what's the going rate? Um, it depends on how many fans you have. You have to pay people. You have to pay influencers to do anything. They, won't, they know how valuable their, um, their mentions are. So... Um, generally, when we're working with a brand, the brand will say, right, we want to talk to lots and lots of different people and we want to create a conversation that's organic and natural and doesn't look forced. And we'll say, right, well, who's your audience? Here's some influencers that perfectly marry up to that audience. Sometimes we'll go very, very broad. We'll choose a range of influencers that um, each have very, very different audiences. So you're touching everybody with one part of the story. Other times we'll go very narrow and specific uh, and it will be five or six influencers all with exactly the same fan base, and they'll all have very different things to say 
and their fans will all get the whole story. And so it all depends. What we don't do is we don't give everybody the same image and tell them to post it. Every single piece of content has to be bespoke because every single person's audience is very different and every single one of those influencers has a tone of voice that's specific to them. So everything has to be handcrafted and um, it's just like the old days. Now, but you have to pay them. You do have to pay them uh, an increasing amount of money. Their parents realize how much money they can make off their kids now. And a lot of them are now starting to get agents at places like CAA and, and WME. So um, the days of being able to just offer them 100 bucks or 1,000 bucks are going. And based upon how many fans they have, PewDiePie, the most viewed YouTuber, I think his going rate is now about a million bucks every time he works with a brand. So it's a massive, massive amount of money that he's making. Um, yeah, I wish I was an influencer, basically. Um, wow, crikey. Okay, so Eric, I apologize for, tr for massacring your name. Uh, generic Floyd um, says, do you think social media has done more to compartmentalize society into like-minded echo chambers or to expand people's worldview? If the former, how can, we, how can we in the entertainment industry overcome this self-selection and expand our audience? I, I believe that it's expanding the world. I really do. I believe that um, there's, there's unfortunate parts to that. The, the days of um, elitism where a select amount of people told the stories, photojournalists were the ones that were winning all the prizes for the most beautiful photograph. Now it's people with an iPhone. It's people out there taking pictures. There are revolutions happening around the world and everybody is taking photographs and posting it on the internet. And I believe that the world is getting smaller as a result and people are more aware of what's happening around the world. Last year there was probably 10 different um, world issues that really were brought to the front, um, whether it was Nigeria and the Bring Back Our Girls campaign or um, things like the, the Ice Bucket Challenge, which most people didn't even know what ALS was until that thing happened. Um, I think people are getting together and um, gravitating around um, values that, that re resonate with everybody in the world. And so I, I have to believe that rather than um, than siloing conversations, it's actually blowing those conversations up. And it's also a very fair way of working out what values are important and which ones aren't. Because if you've got a marginal view that doesn't resonate with lots of people, it will die very, very quickly. But if you've got something really valid and valuable to say, then it will, it will spread far and wide. Um. So Christina E. says, if there are three things I must do in regards to social media, what are they? Um, f f f well, I think we've already established you don't have to actually do anything. But if, you're, if you want to take the challenge, then the first thing you have to do is embrace it. Like really um, get, understand those platforms, get involved, just start to post things and see what happens, experiment. No one really knows what's going to happen when they start posting things. Um, a lot of influencers that are very, very famous, they now have a very specific formula to why people like to follow them, but you don't really know what people are going to inter be interested in until you start posting about it. And so the most important thing is you know, choose a couple of platforms that you think that your content and your stories will work well on, and then just start posting things and see who replies and who follows you and what people like and what people don't like, and start fi fine-tuning it in order to um, really understand what values you have that people value themselves. Um, and I think, that's really, I think that's really the main thing. Um, there's lots and lots of, I won't go through the granular things, there's lots and lots of best practice that you can find on the internet. Irrespect, you know, irrespective of what platform, there are lots and lots of word counts, things that you should be doing, hashtags you should be using. Um, every single platform has a set of rules that if you follow, your posts will be more effective. And it's, there's, they're too complicated and they change too fast for me to go through them all today. Uh, I'm lucky because I've got editors and a QA team that know 
when to post and what to post and how long it should be and where the image should, should be. That's another thing that you should get to know is what those rules are per platform because they're very different depending on the platform. Um, and it's worth experiment. I mean, a lot of money is going into these new emerging platforms like Snapchat. Snapchat are uh, adamant they're going to take over the world. Don't go on Google+, Plus; it closed down today. But, um, but Snapchat is, is definitely one to watch in the future. It closed in the last couple of days, yeah. It's, Google Plus has now become two separate entities. One is uh, a photo. Lots and lots of people have got um, Google phones and they were taking photographs and they were automatically going to a Google Plus account. So now it's become a photo storage place and also a, like a news feed, but it's not, it's not a social network like it was before. It, unfortunately, the experiment failed. Turns out the only people on it were Google employees. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a shame, but there we are. Um, Jeffrey Taylor says, social networks, is it mainly about the need to be loved? Yes, to a certain extent. I mean, I guess that's essentially what this presentation is about. Um, there's, I, I'm fascinated by the behavioral psychology, obviously, behind why people are using these platforms. And as the world, as our world expands, our social networks become very fragmented. So um, a few hundred years ago, you'd, you wouldn't move from the village you were born in, and all of the people you knew would live within a few yards of you. So it was very easy to connect with them, and, and it was a very easy to feel part of that group but now we live all over the world and our friends live on the other side of it and it's very difficult to keep a lot of those relationships solid and to, to keep a grounded understanding of our place within our social our social network and there's very interesting studies there was a guy called Robin Dunbar who um, has done huge amounts of studies he actually he actually weighed primates brains and then counted the amount of um, social connections they had in their social group. And from the weight of the primate's brain and the weight of the primate themselves, he calculated that based upon those numbers for gorillas and monkeys and different primates, that human beings could only cope with 150 uh, different social connections. Anything more than 150 emotional connections, uh, we, our brain can't cope with it and we have to have formal lines of communication with them. So. Uh, lots of people have done studies around what's become Dunbar's number of 150 people and shown that organizations function best when there's less than 150 people and that uh, medieval villages and Amish communities are about 150 people and 150 is a number that appears all the way through um, history. And Dunbar actually went to Facebook and MySpace, which were the dominant platforms at the time, and Facebook said, well, we've got people who have got 2,000, up to 5,000. I know people with 5,000 connections on Facebook. And they said, so your number, doesn't, you know, your number isn't valid. And he showed that actually the only real uh, relationships that even people with 5,000 connections on Facebook had, the real relationships were still around 150. They, they didn't connect with the other people um, very regularly. And actually, it was just a way of collecting every single content they, contact that they'd ever had. But the problem is that within that 150, we now have groups of fraternities and family members and um, work colleagues and, and school friends and these little groups that tend to be around 10 to 15 people. And these are, these, these are groups of people that we have very, very, very close affinities with that normally revolve around a single value, whether it's family or a memory like school, and we've kept in very, very close contact with them, but we're now, we're now interacting with them um, and, and loads of other sub-tribes within our social network. So it's very difficult to, to please all of them when you're posting content. And this is one of the reasons why um, younger kids tend to be a lot more snidey and, um, and troll a lot more than older people, because when you're younger, your social network actually is a lot more polarized around school. So you can, you can troll around a polarizing thing that you can be pretty sure your friends will actually agree with you with and they'll all get snidey together. As you get older, your, your, fr your sub-tribes have very, very different views. You know, I know my mum hates my tattoos. So it's very difficult for me to post content that is going to please all of those groups. So this is why it tends to gravitate towards more positive sentiment, because you're going to polarize and ostracize some of your some of your social network the minute you post content that's 
that's specific to one group. That's where Google Plus actually had the right idea because they create those circles so you could talk to all of your subgroups separately. I'm pretty sure they knew all about that, the, 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 the Dunbar number when they did that, but Facebook still had the jump on them so it never actually took off. Um, so James Dunn says, is it not apparent that social media has devalued the true essence of life, um, the emotional experience of life? I think, hopefully, I have to believe that it's not just about questionnaires and list, BuzzFeed lists and pictures of kittens and puppies, that there is something more vital and substantial in some of the content in social networks. Yes, it is a, um, it's a result of kind of the way that life has been digitized. Young kids just sit in front of their computer all day long and people aren't interacting with one another um, face to face as much as they did and I think that is really, really sad. And we don't, we don't actually create much anymore. There's not that much tangibility to what we do. Art used to be something you could touch, feel, smell. Now it's all digital. I realized the other day that nothing I've ever created has ever existed. Like the, the, the result of all of my efforts is absolutely nothing, which is pretty, which is pretty sad and um, depressing. So, and then someone said to me, well, look, you're bringing joy into the world. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of positive sentiment behind what you do. You're actually making it a better place. You're bringing to light certain um, issues. You know, it's, it's because the brands realize that they've got to connect with something more than just the product. You get brands like American Express who, who actually, this year we work with American Express. American Express is really interesting. Every 20, 25 years, they completely change who they are. And they were a stagecoach company, and then people started wiring money, and they became um, a traveler's checks company, and then people started using plastic, and they became a, a charge card company. And now they're re re realizing that, that, that maybe the exclusivity of their cards won't last forever. So now they're looking at other um, avenues for their, um, um, for their stories. And they've realized that there's this huge um, untapped market of underserved, underbanked people in America, about 60, 70 million people don't have access to banks. And they, uh, they, work, they live a, a cash-in-hand existence, and they can't get back on the ladder. And there's not many people that are serving them particularly well, and it's very difficult to get them back on the ladder. So they've decided to start um, talking to those people and telling stories to those people. So we commissioned participant Davis, Davis Guggenheim to, to create a... Um, uh, a 45 minute documentary about the underserved. It's called Spent Looking for Change. And um, so you have to believe that this hopefully is, is good, a good, these are good things. Hopefully these, are, these, these initiatives are gonna make the world a better place. We got probably about, probably about 18, maybe 20 million people have viewed that so far. So um, I think there's good things coming out of social media. I have to believe it's more than just, more than just junk even though we do create a lot of junk. Um, right, that's all these questions finished. I'm not sure if there's any more now. These ones, cool. So, <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask this. So Kenny says, what do you think is the next evolution in digital marketing? Um, if I knew that, I wouldn't be here. I mean, I'd be in Saint-Tropez counting neat piles of cash on my, on my mega yacht. <laughs> Actually, I don't, I'm not sure if that's my style, but... Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think if I was to make a guess or if I was to start searching for what the next big thing is going to be, I'd be looking for places where people have emotional needs that aren't fulfilled by modern day life. Right? There's, there's, there's a lot of very irrational platforms out there that don't make sense at all and yet people are using them a lot. There's, there's, two, um, there's two, two networks, two, two apps called Whisper and Secret and they're exactly what they sound like. One allows you to say things anonymously to people, completely strangers. 
And the other one is to tell people secrets about people that you know. I mean, this is things that we've been doing all our lo like for thousands of years, but it's very difficult when everybody lives around the world and you've got things that you just can't keep to yourself. There's no rational, re there's no rational reason for doing it, but people are doing it in their millions. So um, that's a great place to start, I think, is to look at what weird, what are some of the weird behaviors that people have that you can't quite explain, and yet people do them anyway, uh, and how do you facilitate them doing it online? And they'll do it. They really, really will do it. Um, uh, so Kenny also says, would you say influencers will blow up even bigger? Yes, definitely. It's becoming a, a, a larger and larger part of the, the puzzle, especially now that they've got agents. And um, how do you think oversaturation will play a factor? I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if it, oversaturation is the factor that's going to be... I think the, the biggest pressure on social networks at the moment is the pressure coming from the people that own them to make money. So Facebook didn't do this for charity. They did it to make money. And they're trying to make their money back. And they make their money back from brands who want to advertise on those platforms. And no one wants that advertising. You don't want... No one watches the, the five-second pre-roll before a YouTube video. Everybody looks at the, the five-second, five, four, three, two, one, skip. So um, there's, this hot, there's, this, there's this tension between the people on those networks and the amount of spam they're getting. And some, some platforms are very good at integrating the advertising in a way that is, for a start, it's intelligent targeting, so it's stuff you actually want to see. And um, some people do it really badly. And I think the people that do it badly and do too much of it will end up, to reject, people will reject that network. And people are already, already having fun with it. I mean, everyone's done that thing where you buy a pair of shoes and for the next two weeks all you see is ads for the shoes you just bought, which is a bit stupid. You're not going to buy another pair. Um, I know someone who actually goes on people's computers when they're not at their desk and goes to a sex toy site he knows targets people and the person can't work out why the same toy keeps coming up on their page every single week so that's that's the big pressure that um and that's where you get sites like lo that was started by a guy who wanted to make an alternative to facebook with no ads on it and people started going there but the trouble is just like google plus unless you get everybody on your site um it doesn't kind of work you need to be connected to your entire social network Um, so Deborah says, do you think that a site like DailyMail.com has become um, like a collective celebrity Facebook? Is this where news is headed? Um, there is a certain amount of dumbing down that you see. Um, the fact that you can gauge what people are engaging with. The reason Daily Mail has become that is because people want to see that. Um, you know, we've, we've worked with news networks before. Um, programming their channels and there has to be a certain amount of popular content even if it still has the serious content in it as well I mean there are sites like The Guardian that is known for for good um, um, genuine news and then there's also channels where people are just going there to see celebrity gossip I think I think very very quickly you see that people are going to your channel to see a specific type of news and once that happens it's very difficult to change people's minds so people will gravitate towards vice or or, or um, huffington post or daily mail or um, the guardian to see specific kinds of news in each case and in the case of the daily mail you can expect nothing more than more celebrity gossip because that's what they're they're, they're that's that's where they're seeing the most traction um, you know, we're, we've been working with um, HLN for a while, Headline News, who've got a, a channel called Daily Share, which is news that's specifically targeted at millennials. That, that channel does have serious news and it has serious issues, but we also create videos where we take um, 
three fast food meals. We take a KFC meal of mashed potato, fried chicken, and coleslaw, and a Big Mac meal, and a Taco Bell meal, and we mash it, and we put it into a sausage, and we do a taste test, because that's also the kind of stuff that millennials want to see. They want to see people spitting sausages out and, and, and saying funny things. So it's a blend, and these people are all curating these channels in order to engage the maximum amount of people. So they know their audience, and they're very clever in targeting them and giving them what they want. Um, and you see it in traditional, you see it on TV as well. You see how uh, Animal Planet has changed from a natural history museum, a natural um, um, a nature program channel a few years ago to cute kittens and hunting and fishing for monster fish. I mean, that's what people ask for, and it's sad because I'd rather watch nature programs, but the, the masses, the majority, say we're not as much interested in nature as we are in cuteness. So, um, so that's what happened. Uh, and so, jo I think it's Joan, again, apologies if I, I'm getting people's names wrong, um, says, do you think your company is more influential than old is, is it advertising methods? If so, doesn't this mean social media is now manipulative? Um, I think, I mean, there's a place for each different form of advertising. Um, social media is great because it keeps you honest. You can't you can't spam people. If people don't want to see an ad, they're, they're not going to see an ad. So we've worked with brands that wanted to be part of a music video, and they've insisted that their ad goes in the first five seconds, and we've seen 85% drop off within the first five seconds. So very, very quickly, you can go back to those people and say, look, if you're going to talk in social media, you have to be... People aren't stupid. They know that their entertainment has to be paid for. And they don't mind a brand paying for it, providing it doesn't get in the way of um, their content and uh, isn't manipulative. And so a part of that question is, do I think social media is manipulative? Uh, I think it, it, it's, it is a way of getting stories in front of people that wouldn't necessarily see them by using influencers and influencing them in that way. But in the same, in the same way, people aren't going to engage with content that they have no interest in. Whereas if you're watching TV ads, the person, unless they get up and switch the TV off or go and make a cup of coffee, are forced to watch whatever you're saying. So very, very quickly, you get feedback from people. And um, so I think that you are getting them to see stuff they wouldn't normally see. But at the same time, you're not making them do anything they don't want to do. Um, and, I, and, and it means that the nature, of the, adver the nature of the advertising we produce is a lot more... Um, uh, organic and natural, and it's a more of a natural conversation, hopefully, at its best. There are some kind of pretty um, um, contrived conversations that you start when the brand isn't a natural fit, but normally you can fine tune it after a while and know what you should be talking about. Um, but I still think people will be spending a lot of money on TV ads for still a few years to come. Um, So Johnny Young says, what is or was the social media contribution to making Furious 7 such a successful film financially? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I do know that you've got Vin Diesel and, I mean, it's a, it's a home run. You've got three of the top eight um, most popular actors in it. So from a social perspective, we weren't involved in that campaign, but I imagine they were leveraging those people pretty seriously. That, that it's, it's also a subject that's very, very dear to the social audience's heart. I mean, all of those, when you look at how many of those people, there was only two women in the top eight, and um, a lot of the men had muscles and monster trucks and very large dogs, and there's explosions everywhere. So they know their audience, and they've been fine-tuning those films for seven iterations. And um, so there's, I, I, there's a number of different reasons. I mean... The unfortunate demise of Paul Walker has probably played a part in the mix as well. The conversation uh, around that was, was, was probably an important factor. Everyone wanted to pay their last respects. There's, there's a number of different... You could... I mean, as I say, if I, if I was involved in that campaign, I'd probably have a much more informed view. But um, it was always going to be a pretty safe bet that that film, unless it really stunk, um, was going to be successful. 
There's bound to be a spin-off as well. Um, I'm not going to even insult you to try and say your name, so I'll just say the question and you'll know who you are. Um, and I apologise. Um, are there brands that just can't be helped? Um, <laughs> Uh, is there much you can do for Microsoft? Um, there are brands that are in worse trouble than Microsoft, believe me. Um, and, and some really, really struggle. The brands that really struggle tend to be the ones that are a, 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 an actual financial value proposi proposition or a feature set rather than a set of values. So that's always a problem when, when you're, I mean, poor Microsoft. They've always, they've always sold their products on the feature set. People have bought them because they want X, Y, and Z. And if you look at their advertising, it's always been, oh, don't buy that Apple. It's all about superficial, um, superficial things like what it looks like and how cool you'll be when people see you with it and fitting in with people and being socially accepted. No, it's more important that you have a, a gadget that has all of the feature set that you want. And everyone's gone, uh, I'm going to go and buy, buy an Apple product. But there, there are people, you know, I've got friends that were uh, staunch Microsoft supporters because of that feature set. So they know, they know that they still have a market. Um, I believe that most brands that want to talk to people, you know, people always say, to, well, what if it's a, to a tissue paper brand? Maybe what if it's toilet paper? How are you going to talk to people about it? And it's like, there are so many things I can talk about when it comes to toilet paper, about what people do when they're sitting on a toilet. You know, all the things they're thinking of. What, there's, there, is a, there are conversations to be had about that because that's something that everybody does. And it, it, it doesn't even have to be comedy. There's, there's, there are conversations to be started about virtually any single brand. The, the problem is the brand... The, the constraints the brand has put ar around themselves. Um, you know, there's the, we work with Ford, and um, Ford have a very specific way that they talk to their, 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 their audience and their consumers. And their cars are always in three-quarter shots, and it's always a beautiful world. And when we first started working with them, they just didn't get the fact that they'd have to change the, the way they looked in social. And over a, a, a number of months, we've been working with them to show that Hey, look, you know, it's, it's fall, and people, or August, depending on whether you're a BAFTA member or a SAG member, um, and, uh, and why don't we take a pump and then Photoshop it, shop it so that there's three pump handles, and one is regular, and one's premium, and one's pumpkin-flavored, pumpkin spice. And they're like, that's stupid. That's a ridiculous thing to do. But you put that up, and millions of people are like that post. And the last thing we did with them was um, we took... Uh, Jason Mraz, and then one of the actresses from Buffy, and, an, and a famous, then a famous environmentalist, and we took them to Lake Arrowhead, Santa Monica Pier, and the Redwood Forest, because they were places that were really important to them. It was places they'd grown up, or it was places where they felt at home in the environment. And we took a famous painter who body paints people and camouflages them into a scene, and we, we took a, a Ford Focus, a really environmentally friendly car, and we painted it into the scene so that you couldn't see it, which is something Ford never did. Like, why would we do a piece of advertising where people can't see our car? All you could see was the blue signs. And then we, the next day, we turned up again, and we took the, the, the celebrity, the influencer, and we body painted them almost naked against the car. Um, and it was called the Leave No Trace campaign, and it was about them being in their element and blending into the environment and it being sustainable and stuff. So this is stuff that people wanted to see, that people thought it was really, really cool from an art perspective and from an influencer's perspective. These people were capturing the content and saying to their fans, check this out, and everyone was liking it all. They were capturing lots of content that they weren't con contractually obliged to post, but it was cool content for their fans to see. So um, it's, it's more about getting brands to break out of those constraints and that, I mean, the brand Bibles for some brands are 150, 200 pages thick, saying the images always look like this, and the logo looks like this, and the car or the, the product, and the, 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 whatever that is they're selling, it always has to be photographed a certain way. Um, it's 70 D, 72 DPI online, and, and it's images like this, and there's normally an Instagram filter over the top. So normal rules do not apply. I'm terribly sorry. I was going to say Adora. It's obvious from, but I thought I'm not sure, and I'm <laughs> sorry, Adora. I won't. I'll remember it now. Um, oh, that's a good question. So Gabriel, or Gabrielle, 
or Gabrielle, says, um, what's the best way to deal with haters on attacks to your brand, movie, song, um, ignore or engage? Um, it depends. Normally it's engage. So we've worked, I won't, and this is being filmed, so I'm not going to mention the brand, but there are brands out there that really, really struggle with um, haters. And every time they post anything, people are cynical about them and say, no, you're doing this, this is manipulative, and why should I believe you? And, and um, certainly, certainly food brands. So, um, so what we normally find is that there are people out there that will just say it's just it's poisonous. They're not, they're not trying to engage. They're not being constructive. They're just saying horrible things. Just, just delete the post. They do it again. Block them. Get rid of them. They're not, they're not there for a constructive conversation. They're not there to engage or to build on the story. They're there just to say horrible things. You'll always get those people. Get rid of them. Um, but people that have a constructive thing to say or uh, they, and have a right to an opinion, the best thing to do is to talk to them about it. And um, normally, you'll find that even if they don't ever agree with you, they'll respect you a lot more for engaging with them and talking to them. And in a lot of cases, there's, I mean, there's great, probably my favorite um, example was someone that, and people do this on Twitter a lot, like Twitter is where people are going and saying, I bought this and it fell apart and the brand jumps on it straight away. It's customer services normally has someone on Twitter the whole time <laughs> saying, like, if anyone says something bad about a brand, jump on it straight away. Because people then track it and say, well, every time anyone said something bad about that brand, the person's come back and they've given them free product or they've offered to fix it. A lot of the time, then the people don't actually send the product to get fixed, but they appreciate the fact that customer service has been there for them. Um, but there was a man that one, went on a Virgin Atlantic flight and said the food was horrible. And Richard Branson made him the, t the, the chief taster of their new menu. <laughs> so that's a perfect example of taking someone that's a hater and making them like your biggest evangelist. And um, so, and I think I've just answered this. So, Eric says, um, it seems like Twitter especially can fuel enormous amounts of group rage. You talk mostly about promoting positive emotions. How do you manage and, and even use these negative ones? So, I think, I think that kind of answers that question. Uh, and that's it. That's all of the questions. So, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, guys. Serving on the table. We'll have parking validation as you slip out, so we'll get that to you guys as you head out. Thanks again.